this point, I want to introduce our two distinguished speakers who have made time to be with us. Ave Yakubu is the program director at Naturally, and there she oversees the day-to-day -day operations of programs and also assists with research. She has over 10 years of public health-related experience in a variety of settings, and her specialty areas include organizational management, strategic planning, as well as maternal and perinatal health. Ave is wrapping up a PhD program in public health, where she's studying the effectiveness of cross-sector collaborations that are aiming to improve perinatal outcomes. We also have our second speaker, Sai Wheeler, and she's a senior researcher at the Women's Rights Division of Human Rights Watch, that is an international human rights research and advocacy group. Her research focuses on the intersection of the right to a healthy environment and sexual and reproductive rights, especially in the context of the climate crisis. Her background is in conflict-related human rights violations. And a fun fact, she used to be a journalist. She is mother to CY who is two and Eve who is five, and she lives in Washington, DC, USA. So now, if everyone's ready, let's get started. Ave and Sai, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Izzy. Um, it's, I, it's a great opportunity to speak with you all, and I'm so proud to be presenting today with um, Ave too. Uh, next slide, please. So these are our um, main goals for the next um, few minutes. Um, we want you to leave with a sense of where some of the most recent published research is on extreme heat impacts on maternal and newborn health, um, and also wildfire exposure impacts as well. Um, this PowerPoint has been um, designed with lots of links in it um, to studies and other useful resources. So please take our emails. Um, if you want to get the slides afterwards, we'd be delighted to send them to you. Um, we'll put our emails in the chat as well. Um, a really important goal um, for us is that you leave with a sense of why the climate crisis is a reproductive justice problem at heart and not quote unquote, just a health issue. Um, it's always the most marginalized who are hurt the most. And in our view, at least, the response requires meeting pregnant people where they are, listening to them and empowering community-based maternal health workers. Um, our last point, which we'll return to to the end, is, is how we're trying, you know, as advocates to encourage midwives, doulas and others to consider themselves increasingly, um, you know, that it's, it's a good idea to recast themselves as climate workers too. Um, of course, in the sense of service providers in a time of increasing um, cri crisis, but also as people who store and share values around care, sustainability, compassion and healing that are much needed at this point. And, you know, the last point um, is that it's really important that we keep our eyes on the fossil fuel industry, the source of the climate crisis. Um, we cannot think only about managing the consequences. Next slide, please. Um, so here's a first um, really useful resource for you. Um, the World Authority on Climate Science, the IPCC, is building an ever increasing body of epidemiology and science on how the climate crisis is hurting public health and slowing our ability to improve health outcomes everywhere. Increasingly, they're making the, the argument that climate harms are leading to unjust inequities in who gets to have a healthy pregnancy and who gets to have a healthy baby between countries, but also within countries. Um, and some of the issues that they raise in, in, in this important report, um, which was for the, fir the first time that, that this problem was really discussed by this group, they looked at drought, the impact on nutrition, on pregnancy, um, heat, which as we'll discuss in more detail is associated with preterm birth and stillbirth, and flooding and other disasters and, and how they kind of disrupt access to healthcare. And then sort of, other things as well, like child marriage, for example, is increasingly understood to be associated with um, disasters because of worsened or occurring because of the climate crisis. Uh, next slide, please. So in response to this growing concern and, you know, some growing body of epidemiology showing some impacts, which we'll, 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 we'll go through some of that in a bit. 
three major UN agencies launched this document um, around around um, towards the end of last year, just before a big UN climate meeting, the COP28. And as they note here, um, just because there's an increase in acknowledgement of the impact of the climate crisis and the impact on health, including on maternal health, this hasn't really resulted yet in any real action. And in fact, even when it just comes to planning, um, very few countries are co you know, consciously planning for protecting maternal and newborn health in the climate crisis. There are also very few midwives and community-based perinatal health workers um, like lactation consultants, doulas, or traditional birth attendants, we're not really hearing from these people. They're not yet um, very involved enough in the climate in the climate space. Um, for example, at COP twenty eight, there were very few midwives. I I only have found one who who went. Who went. Okay, uh, next slide, please. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to jump into extreme heat and maternal and newborn health. Next slide, please. So um, starting in the US, as I'm sure everyone on this call is aware, we have a human rights crisis in the US where racism and both old and newer systems of injustices are making people sick and driving unjust inequities in maternal health outcomes. Um, because of various kinds of advantages across a lifetime, preterm birth rates are half as bad for white women as compared to black women. And a black infant is more than two times more likely to die than a white one. Uh, maternal mortality rates were just as high among the highest income black women as amongst low income white women. So just to, an indicator that this goes across um, income levels as well. Uh, next slide, please. So our work or what we've been trying to do in partnership with other organizations is really to draw attention to the ways the climate crisis, including extreme heat, is worsening these inequities. So. A study came out in 2020 that really was a game changer for us, and it showed it was a review study, and it included several studies um, in the U.S. showing um, that extreme heat, higher than usual temperatures, were driving preterm birth and stillbirth. Um, in both cases, um, both the cases, the preterm birth studies and the ones that also looked at stillbirth or looked at stillbirth independently, we saw a bigger effect size on black pregnant people than on white pregnant people. And newer studies, for example, in Minnesota and in Texas, for example, um, have shown the same thing again. And indeed, right down at the bottom is a, a really big study of data from across the US. And again, they found, I quote, we consistently find that an additional day with mean temperature greater than 80 degrees Fahrenheit or less than 10 degrees Fahrenheit increases preterm birth and low birth weight. Strikingly, the adverse effects are borne disproportionately by Black and Hispanic mothers, suggesting that the projected increase in extreme temperatures may further exacerbate the existing birth health disparities across different race ethnicity groups. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this slide um, talks a little bit about maternal um, health. And again, um, we're seeing um, more and more studies that are showing us that extreme heat has impacts on maternal health, um, aside from impacts on birth outcomes. Um, so this, the first study from South Africa is really helpful. It showed um, exposure to high temps linked with maternal hypertension. Um, but there's also been some studies that seem, to, that seem to be suggesting that gestational diabetes could be worsened by heat. And um, a couple of studies there at the bottom, these are both studies done in the US on hospitalizations and the second one on pregnancy complications. And in both cases, you see um, hikes in these, in these kinds of problems um, around times of extreme temperatures. And in both cases, the effect on, on black pregnant people is greater than on white pregnant people. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a study that looked at um, severe maternal mor morbidity. Um, and again, both long and short term maternal health exposure during pregnancy and increased risk of severe maternal morbidity. I just included this slide because I, I think it's really interesting that both long and short term heat exposure can have an impact. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is um, a big um, scoping review study, um, and it looks at um, heat stress and stillbirth as well, which I think is um, a subject that 
has rightly been um, increasingly gaining attention or more than it more, more than it has before um even out, outside of of the um service providers in in the reproductive justice space um so just this is a study that really looked a little bit more into that um and then there's another link there which i think is interesting because it it provides a little bit of information about why this might be happening um there are lots of different possibilities as to why extreme heat might be having this impact on preterm birth and stillbirth um Dehydration and blood flow diversion away from the placenta are just two of the of the possible mechanisms, and we're not sure yet which one is is most important. But all the studies in this big review paper found again that socioeconomic factors really influence how bigger bigger problem heat is for you if you're pregnant. Next slide, please. Um, even though there's all this science and epidemiology, we're still not seeing the kind of action to access to information and actionable um, advice um, that people really need. So this is a study that even in the US, something very simple, such as including pregnant people and provide providing some advice and information on websites, which is, you know, as as public health outreach goes, is a fairly light lift. Um, that's still not happening in many places. Um, however, we are seeing more and more um, doctors and other health care providers sort of really talking about climate change and, and more efforts to get doctors and nurses and other health workers on board and talking to clients. And this has always been a problem here in the U.S. regarding environmental health um, advice and information because clinicians tend not to have the time to provide this kind of information to patients or clients or the training um, to provide um information and advice on environmental determinants of health. Next slide, please. Here in the US, we've been doing a, um, some work to try and understand if doulas might be able to help provide information and advice and what their interest level is in addressing root causes of the climate crisis, the fossil fuel industry too. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a photo of a training we did with a doula agency partner in Miami a highly climate impacted part of the US and especially for lower income Haitian immigrants and other black women. Community doulas in the US have great trust levels with their clients, know their home and work environments and do a lot of planning with clients already and a lot of connecting them with important resources, all skills highly relevant for climate health. Next slide, please. So this is a study or uh, some research that the White Ribbon Alliance did on pregnant and postpartum women in SIND. Um, as you might remember, um, in 2020, uh, SIND, uh, sorry, in 2022, SIND experienced absolutely catastrophic flooding and also a major heat wave. Um, this was clearly in a, a, a situation where historic failures to protect maternal health, um, the this part of um, the world has some, some really extraordinarily bad preterm birth rates and maternal mortality rates already compared even to India or Bangladesh. Um, and, you know, we're finding like the climate crisis now adding even more pressure on a community that can ill afford it. The interviews with- Oh, the... oh, oh my God, oh, oh. <clears throat> so we found, um, when the, the after these interviews um, with pregnant and postpartum breastfeeding um, mums, um, mental health impacts were very significant. Um, extreme heat had a really big impact on mood, their feelings about their future, their relationships, including with children. Um, and one of the really interesting findings um, were that was that care work creates exposure to more heat. For example, cooking over a hot fire in already um, extreme heat, collecting water, unpaid subsistence farming. Um, so the care work was really important part of understanding how extreme heat impacts um, this community. Um, worries about heat impacting the health of their pregnancy was also reported. Um, and reporting, um, and women also reported that the baby breastfeeding really struggled to breastfeed well when it was hot and it made both them and the baby very frustrated. Um, the standing water after the flooding additionally added to humidity 
And um, poor families also lost fans, for example, in the flooding that was destroyed by the flooding. So this is just an example of a huge problem we have, which is compounding harms from different climate impacts. Um, next slide, please. Sleep is really important. Um, it has a huge impact on mood and well-being. Um, in Pakistan, um, the interviews we heard were, were, for example, women staying up hour after hour to dampen and fan their babies all night, waving their hands, fanning their babies that couldn't sleep because of the heat, um, and themselves having problems sleeping because of the heat as well. Um, this link is a really interesting study yet from Yale Climate Connections, um, and they basically um, reported one 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 story of one woman that really stuck with me, um, and she had very low hemoglobin. Um, very low iron levels in her blood. And after visiting the doctor many times, um, he decided it was the lack of sleep was leading to the drop of hemoglobin in the blood. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we're also seeing um, more qualitative research about how communities and pregnant women are experiencing extreme heat. This one is in Burkina Faso. Again, the misery of heat came out really strongly the impact on relationships newborn relation relationships with the newborn but also other children and adult relationships um also a focus in this um, academic paper on breastfeeding as a crucial vulnerability for extreme heat and a lack of awareness um from pregnant people but also generally in the community about the dangers of heat and impact on health yeah we can go to the next study actually we can go to the next study slide now so this is also another qualitative study. It's really not an easy read. Um, there's a, a lot of description from the people who were interviewed as heat as an inescapable and oppressive force on everything with a huge impact on their well-being. Um, this, this part of Kenya, Kalifi, where this study took place has an additional problem, which is there's very little water. Um, there's a lot of drought in the area. And when if you don't have electricity, you're gonna be very dependent on water for cooling. Um, so getting water is also gendered work, which often lands on women, um, including when they're pregnant, and it adds to the heat burden that they experience. This report also talked a lot about breastfeeding, the baby being too sore from skin problems that um, mothers attributed, attributed to extreme heat, too irritable to feed well, um, and really wrecking the sort of sense of connection um, and peace between the mom and the baby. And also the study also noted that kangaroo mother care was also impacted that it wasn't happening because of comfort and hygiene reasons to do with it being too hot. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this study in the Gambia studied the impacts of heat on the health of pregnant subsistence farmers. Um, and they found uh, the effects of maternal health stress exposure was significantly associated with fetal strain. Um, they saw signs of fetal distress. Um, this study, um, there's also a link here with another study of the, uh, which provides a bit more information about the biology. Um, it's not yet clear what is most important, um, but this study worried that blood might be taken away from the skin, to, away from the placenta towards the skin to help cool the pregnant worker down. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this study also really underlined, like the last one, the, the importance of labor, the importance of safe work is crucial in efforts to address extreme heat on pregnancy health. Um, in this particular study in India, heat and work together doubled the risk of miscarriage in this study. Um, we do not have systems set up to protect workers from heat. Um, and that not just like in factories and you know in big agricultural farms, but also in care work, subsistence farming, informal work like in markets or in the home, where we find pregnant people in some of the most climate high risk countries in the world. Uh, next slide, please. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Ave now. All right, so now I'm going to go um, a little more in depth uh, for the next uh, 10 minutes or so to talk about how wildfires are also a reproductive justice issue. So I'll be talking more in depth of one type of environmental disaster, but just know that this can be applied to um, the different types of environmental crises. So when we talk, when I talk about, when we talk about um, this as an environmental disaster, um, our reproductive justice issue, this is, we're talking about having policymakers 
um, think about ways to create uh, ways to mitigate these issues beyond just general education. So we're thinking about incorporating policies and having recommendations that include meeting pregnant and or recently postpartum people where they are and providing support in the context of ways that are comfortable for them. So that means having community health workers or other types of supports that can provide day-to-day -day support. Next slide. So what's the problem when it comes to wildfires? So wild, wildfires continue to be a growing problem in, in Oregon, and Oregon is in the northwestern region of the United States. Um, wildfires are also um, a common issue throughout the western region of the United States and also north. Our northern neighbors in Canada had uh, also had a major uh, wildfire issue fairly recently, and um, that had uh, associated implications throughout the United States as well, as the air quality and toxins also moved into the United States. So um, part of the reason that wildfires are an issue in terms of perinatal health outcomes have a lot to do with the impact on the air quality and the toxins that are in the air. So this includes tiny particulate matter, also called PM 2.5. These um mat these matter these air matters are bad for everyone. They can cause many different health issues, including respiratory problems, cardiovascular problems, and can lead to um, adverse birthing outcomes, including including stillbirth, miscarriage, infertility, preterm birth, low birth weight. And, and James kind of looking sus there. low birth weight and um, maternal hypertension, just to name a few. Um, across the US also, wildfires now account for 40% of the total particulate matter emitted into the country. Emitted into the country, making it a major source of the pollutant. Um, in addition, we have HAPs, which are also referred to as hazardous air pollutants um, that are also known toxins, um, for example, formaldehyde, um, benzene, acetal, acetal, acetaldehyde, acrolene, for example. Um, so when you think about, when you hear about these toxins, a question that comes up is where are they coming from? Well, they're coming from the different um, products that are being burned when there is a fire. So when you think about when a fire occurs, especially a wildfire, you have the, you have the, you have the, um, you have both artificial and natural products that are being burned. So when you think about like, when the uh, unfortunate incident of like a house burning, think about all the materials that you have in your house that are not natural products. So like your carpet, the couch, all these types of things. Um, these are all emitting now toxic chemicals. And so then I talked about some short-term implications, but there's also long-term implications. There's evidence of neurological issues in children later in life if, they're, if their parent or the if they're infants during the time of an environmental disaster. And there's also data on um, implications of cancer after having been exposed to an environmental disaster and adverse air quality. Next slide. So what are other problems besides air quality? quality. Another problem is stress. Just think about the reality of experiencing a wildfire a wildfire disaster or any other type of environmental disaster. Your the all the aspects of your state of living and well-being are affected. So you have both short-term and long-term implications of stress. Um, I know most of you are in the healthcare field and or are midwives or are in related fields. So I'm probably preaching to the choir about the effects of stress. So stress during pregnancy, it has implications in terms of preterm birth, low birth weight, et cetera. Um, a study that was recently published titled The Perinatal Mental Health Outcomes Following Natural Disasters says that 
Prenatal and perinatal stress due to natural disasters can lead to adverse pregnancy outcomes such as prematurity, reduced birth weight and head circumference, and other neonatal complications, especially in women in highly exposed to disaster-related stressors. And then you have the long-term implications. Exposure to stress and excess glucose glucocorticoids during fetal development can lead to cardiometabolic, neuroendocrine, and cognitive effects associated with, associated with a vast array of illnesses later in life. The mental health of the mother is also a major implication and can strongly influence child development that um, child development later in life as well. Next slide. So given some of this background information of the implications of wildfires, Human Rights Watch and Nurturally, we collaborated to, do, to conduct a qualitative study to assess what providers and health, what are the experiences of providers and other health officials with providing care or support to families in the perinatal period during wildfires. So we conducted informant interviews with community community based health workers, doulas, doctors, state public health officials, midwives, and then even nationally, we did talk to a couple other representatives from some US government agencies, include, including the Environmental Protection Agency and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Next slide. So what did we learn? Now I'm going to go through some of our key findings. Next slide. The first thing we learned is that not everyone has access to the resources needed to protect themselves. So the key populations that we found are most susceptible to uh, negative consequences of environmental disasters are immigrant communities, communities already facing racism, low-income communities, pregnant people who do not have stable housing, and also communities in Oregon who do not speak English or Spanish. So with immigrant communities, it's common for them to work in the agriculture sector. So many of them work in fields or farms, they're outdoors. Um, so they're having direct exposure to the um, poor air quality. Communities already facing racism. So like black communities in Oregon, they may be less able to manage the other stress related to wildfires. So when I talk about racism, we're talking about systemic racism. So the historical implications about having resources, whether it be economic resources and or support network to be able to successfully relocate after experiencing um, an environmental disaster, or even the place that they actually lived when they experienced a disaster. There are many examples of how um, populations that have been marginalized are pushed into region, into geographic regions that are more at risk of negative exposures. Um, for low income, low income pregnant people may be more likely to live in housing that um, is not as well insulated or protected, so they're still having more exposure to smoke and or might not have the access to proper air purifiers or filters. Um, lack of stable housing is probably self-explanatory, um, not having access to proper shelter for protection. And then um, for those that have um, language, um, do not speak English or Spanish, they may be less likely to receive information or to be aware when there are warnings of uh, different hazards or um, an oncoming environmental disaster. Next slide. So another area that came up were mental health concerns. So the most common concerns that came up are stress, anxiety, and trauma. Um, these are some of the quotes that we re received from um, different people that were interviewed. For stress, someone said, I do know that the stress is having a big impact. The stress about the air quality, pregnant people are stressed about whether they're going to need to leave their home or whether they might lose their home. So it's not even just about the stress of the disaster itself, but it's how are they going to cope after losing their property? 
For anxiety, I would say for sure wildfire is worse for patients with anxiety, and it's a legitimate concern for them too. We have people with antepartum anxiety, people who want to make the best decisions and do everything right, but you can't control a wildfire. And you also can't get away from the smoke. It adds to the anxiety. People were messaging us frequently looking for reassurance that they are doing everything they can um, instead of being able to leave. And then there's, of course, trauma. For the last several years, there's really has been a developing seasonal trauma. It's like a PTSD response. People are getting very anxious at the smallest hint of fire. Next slide. So next, there's also a concern about the delays in accessing care. I won't read all of the quotes, but the point is that during environmental disasters, going to the doctor is no longer, is not a top priority for families. Families are looking for a safe location to relocate to. And then also families avoid going outside because of the poor air quality. Next slide. Experiencing wildfires has limitations to birthing choices. So giving birth during a wildfire can be a very scary and disempowering situation and at such a vulnerable time in a patient's life. So maybe a patient had a, a plan or an idea of where or how they wanted to give birth, but because of the environmental disaster, they, don't, they no longer have options and they have to uh, use the method that is the safest and most available, but it's not what they had wanted for their birthing experience. Next slide. And then lastly, we got some feedback on the effects on the staff or providers pro uh, providing care to the community. So they have a lot of worry, stress, and they feel unprepared. So one person said, it's hard to trying to maintain good patient care while worrying. Will my house go up in smoke? Is my health going to be damaged? So not only are they thinking about the well-being of their patients, they're also having to be thinking about the well-being of themselves, their own families, where they live, et cetera. And as far as feeling unprepared, they said that their education as maternal health providers does not have much information on environmental health. So there's a gap in the education and knowledge that is provided to healthcare providers um, in terms of this um, growing issue and crisis. Next slide. So we collected a lot of different information on, um, on, you know, on the experiences of providers and other professionals. Um, so what do we do about that? So Nurturally and Human Rights Watch, we created a toolkit. We have a lot of different types of marketing and educational materials that can be reviewed to um, provide education and tips to providers on how to um, support how to support uh, families. So you can see on our website, nurturally.org slash wildfires, you won't get direct access to the toolkit, but there is a link. If you click on the link, you'll be redirected to how to sign up. And then you'll be given, you'll be given directions on how to get access. Next slide. Um, and this is just an example of some of the resources. If you visit the website, you will see a list of different resources. A lot of those resources are central to Oregon, but it might give you some ideas on like ways to provide support for other environmental disasters. Next slide. All right, so now we'll hand it to Sky to conclude. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just a slide about um, the scale of the problem. Um, an estimated three to six billion individuals uh, may find themselves confined beyond the uh, a livable uh, region. Um, but the good news is that we know what needs to happen to solve this problem. And we're already seeing some important steps in ending fossil fuel operations that are wholly insufficient. 
Um, in fact, emissions continue to rise, but it can be built on if there is political will. Uh, next slide, please. I'm just going to move on from this slide um, to the next one. Um, our, the people we interviewed about the wildfires, they talked about lots of things that they thought that um, pregnant people needed in order to be better protected from wildfires and also what they needed um, as uh, midwives, doulas and doctors working with this population. But um, many of them also um, really underlined how important it is. Um, that as well as um, sort of climate adaptation, like putting things in place to protect people, we need um, major um, a climate emergency response. Uh, one midwife said, I want a systems high, systems level high up response to this as an emergency. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just where I want to leave, to leave you. Um, the work that we've done has really spoken to us again and again. The research has 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 had a voice, and and what it said is really, you know, how important community based health workers are. Um, you know, work health workers of of many different kinds who who work closely um, within communities. Um, we're looking for health workers that have the time to talk about preventative health and environmental health, um, who are trusted by their communities, who understand not just you know clinic clinical information but also understand the homes the work and the wider environment of pregnant clients um including how the stresses of being a marginalized community um intersect with climate damage that also our activists um are now speaking for their communities uh, workers who are able to connect clients with important non-clinical assistance and understand um oh understand and that center care over profit and are breaking down silos in who has authoritative knowledge and health in health and politics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ave and Sai. That was very, very insightful. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. We feel